Welcome. Um, so, you know, we are going to talk through what turbo cider is. We're going to talk through some of the different variations I've used so far. And we're also going to have a look at some of the lessons learned, some of the factors that were really interesting to me in creating a version 2.0 recipe. Um, I'm then going to do a walkthrough of that recipe and some of the lessons learned from version 2.0 and what version 3 might look like. And then finally, I'm going to look at some of the plans that we have underway for our videos throughout September and October. So let's have a look at what is turbo cider. Now, turbo cider is an alcoholic cider, just like you're used to. The only difference really is the fact that it's made with apple juice from the supermarket rather than having to go and crush the apples yourself. So um, effectively, the turbo part of turbo cider is certainly that ease of creation. So you can really throw all of these ingredients together very, very quickly um, and put them away with some yeast and very, very quickly you have a turbo cider. Um, and it is that simple. Um, now, I've created a few different variations of turbo cider as I've been going through my journey. And the very, very first turbo cider that I created was a very simple and slow turbo cider. Um, I call it simple and slow because it was the first one. And actually, I was following the rules precisely. Um, and now this cider came out at a lovely 6%, which was the goal. Um, and it took 33 days from start to drink um, to complete. And the ingredients for this cider was simply the apple juice, four leaves of apple juice. There was some simple champagne yeast, um, literally bought it from Amazon um, and Googled champagne yeast and that's what I used. Um, also, similarly, I Googled yeast nutrient and added some yeast nutrient. Um, and finally, I added a nice strong cup of tea. Now, this may seem like the most unusual of the ingredients, but this is to help create some of the tannins that you would get from a normal apple. So um, apple skins, I understand, actually sort of in, in normal cider would create some of that tannin, which gives it some of its viscosity, some of its mouth feel, and you lose some of that when you sort of use apple juice. So a nice strong cup of tea, uh, not drank, but added to your cider, um, is something that you do to add those tannins in. And then finally, you know, you can start to add some flavoring, some carbonation. And actually this is where um, experimentation is so much fun with a turbo cider, because um, I split my 4.5 liters into effectively three separate 1.5 litre batches, one of which was sweet, so I added some non-fermentable sugars, one which was carbonated in the bottle, so sort of stashed away to carbonate, and then the third was both sweet and carbonated, combining the two um, together. Um, and that taught me quite a lot of the basics for a turbo cider. And as a starter for 10, it really is all you need to, um, to get going. Um, but about sort of two thirds of the way through that process, um, I started to get a little bit impatient and, um, and I started a second turbo cider. Now this turbo cider, I was going for no frills. It was apple juice. It was sugar. I wanted more of that alcohol. It was champagne yeast and away I went. Um, none of that mucking about with cups of tea or anything like that. Um, now, this was chaos. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what is the most surprising end result of this one? Um, I mean, it was 17 days end to end um, and uh, we were drinking it, um, was how resilient Turbo Cider is to all of the things you can do wrong and throw at it and still actually deliver something that is remarkably drinkable. Um, so um, I again did exactly the same, you know, sort of after this fermentation had completed, I took my 4.5 litres and I split it into three. Um, once again, I did my sweet and carbonated, which which was lovely, um, albeit that now it's 9% lovely. Um, um, I also sort of added some extra apple juice to one of them and I added cranberries to another. Now, if you watch the playlist of the Turbo Cider Take 2, you will discover what I discovered, which is obvious to probably everybody, um, um, but was not obvious to me when I was um, starting out on this journey, which was adding apple juice or adding fruit 
would restart fermentation. So um, when I say it was 9%, it probably wasn't 9%. It was probably a, um, a little bit higher than that. Um, and, um, and actually, what is still surprising is although the cranberry version um, um, sort of fermented away quite violently, and it was like, oh my goodness, um, I, we ended up with a drink that was almost wine-like in its flavor. Um, so it just goes to show even the most chaotic mistakes that you can make, turbo cider, um, will find a way to deliver something that is tasty. And then we have Turbo, the third recipe. And, and this recipe I saw online um, from a site called Moss Home and Garden. Um, so credit to Moss Home and Garden for this recipe. It was blueberry essence they used. I've used strawberry essence, but otherwise everything else is the same. And this again was a very, very logical um, set of ingredients. So it was the apple juice, it was the sort of champagne yeast. There were four tea bags used this time, and actually those four tea bags were steeped in 500 milliliters of a bottled water, um, and there was additional brewing sugar added to up the up the ABV a uh, little bit. And then for flavoring, there was my protein flavor drops, which are effectively they're a gluten-free, um, low-calorie fl flavoring essence, which you dropped in. Now they were slightly colored, and I'll come back to that because they added a lovely little color to the um, to the cider as well. Um, and then you know at the very end, after fermentation had completed. Um, bottle carbonation was was, was done, um, and the car bottle carbonation was done with a combination of both table sugar, sort of almost a 50-50 split of table sugar and uh, brewer's corn sugar um, to create that carbonation. And the end result of this one was an 8.4% ABV um, cider. It was um, sort of uh, around 67 days in the making from, from end to end. It was very slowly, slowly and carefully done um, as per the, the instructions in the uh, recipe. Um, and, um, and effectively, it did work out very well. And, and in fact, it worked out so well, I have a bottle here to share. Um, now, I can't share it with you through the screen, unfortunately, but what I can do is share a little bit um, and let you know what, it, um, what it's turned out like. So, there we go, let me just move that there. I have been looking forward to this all day. And now, um, the clarity, let me move that there, the clarity is wonderful. It was a lot, slightly reddish hue from the strawberry flavoring essence. Um, there's got a lovely cider smell um, now. Um, and my friends actually have been drinking some of this and they have said that they particularly like this one. So this one has definitely been an all around winner. Um, oh, I'll put the bottom top back on, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so, Oh, and I see why. Ah, yes. Um, now, this is it is interesting using um, essence and flavorings because when I first bottled this early on, um, it almost felt like um, it was like um, it was a very artificial strawberry flavor to it. And the fact that a little bit of time has passed since bottling day, um, that sort of artificial sort of a flavour to it has gone. Um, funny enough, a lot of the strawberry flavour has gone as well. It's not, it's not a strong strawberry flavour. It's just a lot. It's almost like an essence, a hint of strawberry flavour in there. Um, but yes, I think you will not argue that this is a very nice cider to try. So if you decide not to do turbo cider version 2.0, then I can highly recommend you try Moss Home and Gardens um, sort of strawberry or blueberry cider because they are a winner. Um, now, just to sort of finish off this section, it's probably worth a little mention of the basic equipment. And the basic equipment I use tends to actually be a five litre water bottle. I don't tend to use a one of my glass demijohns. I tend to actually just 
go with the flow and use a five litre um, bottled water bottle. Now this has a bit of an advantage because I can just throw it away at the end and it saves on washing up because I'm a lazy kid. Um, but also it, you know, it, it, it does make life a lot easier in terms of the amount of equipment that I have lying around because I'm starting to obsess as if you've sort of started to see one of my previous live streams I am a bit of a techie at heart. I like my like my gadgets and toys, and I've been collecting quite a few. Um, so you just need a five liter water bottle or a five liter demijohn. Um, you need an airlock. Now there are alternatives to an airlock, but for a couple of quid, come on, guys. Um, and you know you need a jug to measure the, the 500 ml of water for the third recipe, and a saucepan or a mug, um, depending on which recipe you're doing for the tea, um, and a funnel just to make sure you can fit it all in through the gap in the top. Um, and that's pretty much all of the equipment that you you really need to do a turbo cider. Now, if like me, you want to be a little bit more precise and you want to collect a bit more data, there are a few other things that you might need. One of them is a jeweler's scales. And in the very first recipe I did, the um, I literally just put all of the yeast in um, completely. Um, and now I realize I did not need to do that. I, I only needed like sort of two grams of yeast, in fact, for the quantity that I was um, that I was using. So actually I use a jeweler scales to just measure out those smaller quantities. So I have um, better use of my, my ingredients, better use of my resources. Um, um, now my jeweler scales, you know, actually does show measurements down to two decimal places, which is, which is more than I need. Um, but you will find with the kitchen scales, it just is not that accurate at the very low end of the, the measure. In fact, my kitchen scales um, doesn't even start to register that I've got anything on the on the scales until I'm starting to get over sort of three or four grams. So there just isn't that level of accuracy at the low end on those sort of um, on those scales. Of course, those scales also go up to a much higher level where uh, which you need from the kitchen scales, which a jeweler scales will will only measure those very small volumes. I also have a hydrometer and measuring cylinder. Um, I like to be able to sort of measure through the um, the sort of ABV and the gravity to, to calculate that ABV. However, you know, uh, taste is everything, and um, and effectively you don't need to be able to sort of have a hydrometer reading to have a good cider. Uh, but if you do want to know how much alcohol is in your cider, this one is 8.4%, then um, a hydrometer and measuring cylinder is useful. A wine thief, or in my case, it is a three pound turkey baster, um, lets you steal the um, the ingredients from the, the, the demijohn, from the your five litre sort of jug, um, and put it into your measuring cylinder to be able to measure the, the hydrometer reading. Finally, a thermometer. Now, there are two reasons for, for a thermometer being useful, and actually two types of thermometer that can be useful. Um, first of all, when you're steeping your, um, your tea, you are actually adding a lot of heat into the ingredients. Um, and some yeasts have a preferred operating temperature. So you want to be able to check that you're not sort of operating, you know, not creating a, um, a set of ingredients that is too high a temperature and will, will harm your yeast. Um, now, as a rule of thumb, that you want to make sure that your um, your must, you know, your all your ingredients mixed together is um, below sort of 30 degrees but different yeasts operate at different temperatures. I've literally just done a salsa where 30 degrees, 30 degrees, 30 degrees, huh, not a problem because it was a cavical yeast and, um, and it operates much better at those higher temperatures. So, so actually, you know, it does vary, but you don't want to kill your yeast if you can help it, if your temperature's too high. So a thermometer is quite useful. There is a second reason as well, because it has, an, a yeast has an optimal um, operating temperature and um, I have one of those stick-on thermometers that goes on the side of the plastic um, my plastic plastic five litre demijohn and um, and effectively I can make sure that I'm storing the the, um, the cider during fermentation at its optimum temperature or as best as I possibly can um, if it needs to be cooler based on the yeast I can stick it under the stairs and if it needs to be warmer then I can stick it in the room next to the airing cupboard um, and hence that's about the amount of range it's capable when you're brewing 
but you can have a little bit of a uh, bit of flexibility there. Um, so that's the type of equipment that you're going to you know, sort of require. Then we come to the um, general experience that you might expect, you know, might sort of expect when doing a turbo cider. And um, from a general experience point of view, you know, a fermentation will generally start within around 12 hours. Um, and and I've tended to find that it's going strong within 36. Uh, so that's um, quite quite useful. Sorry, excuse me. Um, quite useful to know and you know it, you find that it's largely done when um, actually it's um, within about seven days um, and although in my take two cider I, um, I rushed through it and didn't wait for everything to clear um, you know you will find that um, certainly on this one um, it was clearing very nicely within that 15 to 20 day mark and um, with the flavour drops there is a slight slight reddish tint to it which I think is absolutely lovely. Um, so you know your expectations for a turbo cider is pretty damn turbo. You can start drinking this darn quick. I've already mentioned the robustness of a turbo cider. So I'm not going to go there again. The other thing I found was that um, in those first two recipes I did, particularly the second recipe, um, the 9% one, um, that the mouthfeel felt just a little thin. And, um, and, and that is one of the things I particularly wanted to focus on when I sort of came to Turbo Cider version 2.0. And so I did find a solution to that. Um, but I'm going to save the magic ingredient um, for a little later on. Um, so how about that for a tease to try and make you watch a bit longer? Um, so um, the factors I think that um, I really learned uh, and wanted to sort of put into practice when it came to Turbo Cider 2.0 um, is there are two basic flavours, um, flavourings that, that get you started. And, and that is actually where I started. The first being the still versus carbonated. So this is a sort of medium carbonation, really, in this one. Um, and uh, because that's a scale, you can go from extremely carbonated to extremely dry, um, and every step in between. So there's a lot you can you can do just with the level of carbonation that you introduce into your drink. Um, the other um, factor that's one of the most basic factors is dry versus sweet and um, and you know certainly I found that um, the first cider I did came out very really quite dry certainly not my taste you know without the sort of uh, additional sort of sweetening in place interestingly carbonation seems to although it's not adding sugar does seem to add a little oh, excuse me does seem to add a little sweetness to your um, to your drink um, so um, so that's that's a sort of interesting thing and again down to personal personal preference but your two basic flavoring options which apply to every every one of the turbo ciders you do is you know how still versus carbonated do you want it how dry versus sweet do you want it and I do quite like it sweet and this has come out absolutely delicious the other thing that um, I discovered through feedback from my videos, so so I want to do a bit of a shout out as a thank you to um, all those folks out there who have been so helpful. As I mentioned at the start, I'm documenting my learning journey, um, and my learning journey means that, that you know there's a lot I don't know, um, and I learn as I go along. So so there have been some folks who have been super super helpful in providing sort of advice feedback and and suggestions in a very kind and friendly way and to all of those people on the sort of um turbo ciders for you um forum on the uk home brewing forum um i want to say thank you very much thank you for your kindness and thank you for the all of the advice you're giving um and pectolase was one of those things i got some advice on so um, I was religiously adding pectolase into um, my turbo ciders. Pectolase, for those who don't know, um, simply is something that removes the haze or the pectins out of a typical, uh, you know, um, um, 
apple juice when you make, um, particularly when you make an apple um, cider from real apples. Um, but the thing that I was missing and the thing that, that, um, that I've learned is that many of the apple juices that I was using, um, not all, but many of the apple juices I was using, did not need me to add any pectolase because they were already clear. Um, and um, so, you know, they do go very cloudy once you add all the sugar and the yeast, etc., and mix everything together. They'll go sort of a, a orange colour for a little while. But once that sort of all settles out, yeah, they will clear again. The point being, the apple juice I was putting in was already clear. It didn't have those pectins in, and therefore I didn't need pectolase, even though I was adding it. So, so lesson learned. Thank you very much for the, for the feedback, um, and um, and then you know and again you know I'm I'm going to um, going to sort of need that information for when you know it is necessary um, to use pectolase. Um, yeast and temperature. I've funny enough I've already mentioned, uh, which is the making sure that you know the, um, the the must is of an appropriate temperature for your. For your um, for your yeast before you put the yeast in, um, and that's only a, for a word of caution, just simply because um, you are adding quite um, you know, boiling potentially uh, water in. You know when you sort of steep in your tea. Um, uh, now, actually, you know, my in my experience, this has never been a problem because all of the yeasts I've been using tend to be operating in pretty wide um, temperature bands, um, and usually I've fallen under that 30 degree mark anyway um, once you've sort of mixed all the cold um, apple juice with the hot water from the steeped tea. Um, but the second one that is more interesting is perhaps when fermenting, making sure you try to locate your um, your fermenting must in a location that is within the optimum temperature range. Um, you know, now in my my experience of um, of a difficulty with this actually came not with the turbo cider, but with the seltzer that I was um, I was sort of brewing, and and effectively I couldn't find it <laughs> because because of the time of year um, I couldn't find anywhere warm enough to keep it at the high enough temperature for the type of yeast I was specifically using and that caused uh, that actually didn't cause me any trouble it just meant the fermentation took longer so it slowed things down. Um, so um, uh, one of the questions I think I asked myself and, and, and I did eventually work it all out was do water profiles matter? Because in my beer brewing I've been learning about water profiles and, and actually making sure that you've got the appropriate profile for most suitable for the beer. And, um, and there are three sort of basic choices really. You can use tap water, you can use bottled water, or you can use you know, pure distilled water. Um, and, um, and, and to be honest, when it comes to the turbo cider, um, you're using such a small amount to steep the tea, it really is irrelevant. Um, and, um, and that, but actually in my last um, brew, um, I didn't actually use water at all. I just simply used some more apple juice and steeped the tea bags in the apple juice. Um, so, you know, eliminating this question entirely anyway. Plus, the fact that you are boiling the water, even if it's tap water, which is, you know, notorious for having sort of chemicals to keep it clean in the pipes, um, sort of chlorine in particular, um, you are probably eliminating a lot of that by the fact that you're boiling it. Um, now, in the recipes I've used, I have used bottled water um, just for safety's sake, uh, but that was probably, in hindsight, a little overkill. Um, and certainly distilled water is a massively high expense for uh, that would be completely unnecessary unless you were doing something that, that particularly unusual. The quantity of water you're using in a cider is so small to nothing, this really was a red herring. And um, um, one of the, um, you know, I've, I've commented about some of the lovely people out there who've been very helpful. And again, thank you to all of those. Um, you know, unfortunately, there are a few people out there who are not quite so lovely, um, unfortunately. And, and, and that was that was a harsh reality that I ran into. Um, and um, and. And it did me derail me a little bit for a little while. Um, and, um, and one of the things they derailed me over is, you know, how could I possibly, possibly conceive about sharing information that might be useful to people when I brew my turbo ciders in plastic bottles? Oh, my goodness, I'm a heretic.
Um, well, you know, um, and, um, and 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 you know, as a as a novice learning my learning my way through this, that I did take that initially um, with a bit of shock. Um, however, in the cold light of day, they are morons, um, and I will move on. Um, so, using plastic bottles is fantastic. I use um, the five liter bottles for the primary fermentation. I split them into 1.5 liter plastic bottles for my um, all my experimentation, and I'm having loads of fun. Um, so stop spoiling my fun and let's get on and try all these lovely, lovely different flavours um, and, um, and, and crack on with it. Um, my last lesson learned as well, and again, thank you very much, um, you know, for this. When I've been filling my bubbler up, I've never really considered how much sanitizer I should put into the airlock before I stick it in the um, stick it in the bun. Um, and, um, and someone very kindly pointed out I was massively overfilling um, my um, my airlock and actually you know the, the the approximate right quantity to use is to fill up you know two of the six bubbles um, within your airlock so again thank you very much I never saw that written down anywhere did not know that and um, and, and and actually um, it has does make some degree of sense not in turbo cider terms but actually in my beer brewing terms where i quite often sort of um when fermentation starts up it starts to spit out my sanitizer out the top of the airlock until it starts to sort of settle down and probably it was because i was just like too damn much in there um and certainly probably more than three bubbles worth um hence the reason it was pushing it out uh, over the top um, so you know again you know thank you everybody to who's been who's been helpful on my journey um, and uh, much it is genuinely much appreciated and I'll try to not to let those trolls um, derail me um, so that is easier said than done sometimes um, so my ingredients for Turbo Cider 2.0 was that 4 to 5 litres of apple juice, it was 2.5 grams, see I'm being more specific now, um, I didn't just throw the whole pack in. Um, now I've been using Lalvin EC, actually there's a mistake there, EC1118 um, sort of yeast and the reason for that is it's a champagne yeast, it's a white wine yeast and it's also actually recognised as a cider yeast. Um, I am actually going to try a few other yeasts because actually it's interesting to see what effect they have but that is, you know, that's the, the being my staple on many of the ciders that I've done. Um, I have been using 2.5 grams of yeast nutrients just to help that along and that yeast nutrient contains nitri nitrates or nitrogen, I'm not sure now, um, <clears throat> the joys of life um, and um, again it just sort of helps to sort of encourage the yeast to, to, um, to grow while it's um, sort of fermenting. Um, you can see my mistake um, and uh, but you know I actually did this so I'm actually recording my mistakes live um, so I did put 2.5 grams of pectolase in my version 2 recipe unnecessarily um, but you know it, I thought I was doing the right thing um, and um, I mean on the one hand you can definitely argue it did no harm but why waste money? Why waste money? Um, you know, so that's um, that was definitely an unnecessary item in my recipe. Um, two tea bags seemed about right, um, and yes, this one did come out pretty good actually. So in terms of tannins, it is it is a bit of personal taste. Um, I've done none, one, four, and two tea bags in my journey, um, and in find, to finding that right taste. Now, um, I also used I talked about water, um, three hundred grams of. Uh, 300 grams, 300 milliliters even of bottled water to steep the tea, and then lots of flavoring fun once again, which I'll come back to. Um, um, the equipment exactly as we looked at before, so I'm not going to go through through that again. Um, so if you check on the um, check on the website, um, you will see Turbo Cider version 2.0 episodes are all are all up except the last one, which was the taste test, which is going to be up on Tuesday. And um, and and here's the basics from that. You know, um, effectively we have you know, apple juice, we have champagne yeast, uh, we have nutrient. 
Um, we have two tea bags, which is giving us the, the mouthfeel. Um, now, I was really disappointed because the ABV came out at 5.25. Well, actually, harsh to say really disappointed. I was a little disappointed they came out at 5.25 because I added no sugar in this recipe. And I think, you know, um, simply adding 82 grams of sugar, um, give or take, would have brought that up to about 6% ABV, which had been much more in line with what I was looking for. So, so again, I think, you know, the no sugar in the Turbo Cider 2.0 um, decision was perhaps the wrong one. And in the future, I would add a little sugar just to make sure we get to that, you know, roughly 6% ABV. But here's where my life changed. And um, and so in the discussions online and different forums, um, one of the suggestions that came up was the use of glycerine. Now, I'm not sure it's exactly, but I think glycerine is the name that's typically used for this in the UK. And perhaps glycerol is maybe more of an international name for the same thing. But either way, um, a little bit of glycerine added into your recipe um, is something that will add a little bit of the viscosity to the to the to the um, drink um, it will add some of that mouthfeel um, so i decided in all of my version two recipes to add exactly the medium amount so there was a range um, specified on the bottle um, and i literally chose the dead midpoint and i went for that um, and it worked <laughs> you know it 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 definitely, definitely improved um, the mouthfeel of the whole thing over my very first recipe. Um, and I also took it slow. I did, you know, I did rush, 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 particularly the take two cider. And, you know, time brings clarity. Um, but also time, I think, um, as we've experienced today in my taste test of the strawberry cider here, um, time brings a little bit of that flavour to develop as well. Um, and that is definitely worthwhile doing. So um, while I do appreciate um, there are probably folks out there just like me who want to race through a few, you know, hey, <laughs> meh, do it. Um, but the basics are that you want to, um, yeah, if you, if you want the best result, you need to give it a bit more time. Now on the screen is the literally the step-by-step -step recipe um, to sort of check in. And so if you want to actually do this for yourself, you can follow those instructions through exactly as they are specified here. Um, there is nothing surprising really. It, we know we steep the tea bag um, up front, we add the apple juice, the nutrient, but you can skip the pectolase um, and then we add the black tea into the, the whole must, shake it all up um, and, um, and then effectively add the yeast and stick in an airlock. Um, the only thing addition to that is perhaps taking a reading if you've got a hydrometer and if your reading is low, um, so if I go back to my, um, my version two recipe that came out at around sort of 5.25%, um, that came out the high, the, the OG came out a little low. Um, if your OG is a little low, then perhaps um, add in a little extra sugar um, that will just up it to give you the ABV that you are looking for. Um, but again, 5.25 may be what you're looking for, in which case, spot on. Um, not a problem, not a problem there. Um, now, I also, in Turbo Cider 2.0, decided to have some fun and games with the flavouring. Um, so, um, so first of all, though, let's have a look at the timing. So, um, it fermented for 15 days. Um, I then I then actually did rack it, um, again, into my three separate 1.5 litre bottles um, for 10 days. And then I bottle carbonated for seven days. So, this was really only just over a month um, from... Um, from the um, sort of brew day through to the glass. So you're not talking about huge amounts of time here, guys. Um, and the three flavors I did was one again was the sweet and carbonated, always, always a winner with everybody. Um, carbonated similarly is always sort of seems to come in second place, though I this time I definitely had competition because I literally threw absolutely everything we've talked about today in terms of flavoring 
all into one recipe and created the damn fine sweet apple pie spiced cider and oh my goodness it was great um so i included in that some essences i included apple drops and vanilla essence i included some spices which were the cinnamon stick the clove the cardamom pod and the allspice berries and the nutmeg um, and you know i also um car i also basically added some sweetness so um i actually added some non-fermentable sugar um, to bring up the sweetness and that's something that also was a lesson learned while making this recipe that the basic recipe was a little little tart a little on the dry um tart's the wrong word dry is the right word and um and effectively um i just simply added some sugars um just to bring up the sweetness a little bit um just before i bottled um and that sort of how non-fermentable sugars um just before i bottled i did not carbonate uh, this um while you know um while there are some lessons to learn off this one um this is the start of a lovely recipe which i'm going to continue to develop um so apple spice you know sweet apple pie spiced is a winner christmas is coming up i think this is a good christmas one um to to definitely consider so what have i learned um well as always i've learned loads um first of all i think you know the ciders i like probably in the range you know six to eight percent well this is 8.4 this is definitely a winner therefore including some sugar in the um in the recipe is necessary one of the things i guess i have noticed is different different apple juices do deliver a slightly different um sort of original volume so original gravity so um you know the amount of sugar you add is not necessarily a predetermined amount but actually you know you may want to do a bit of a calculation to figure out um what is the right um quantity of sugars to use and and there are there are calculators online you know brewer's friend have got calculators for adding sugars to bring up the um, bring up the abv um, I think I can be a bit more adventurous with the spices. I was a little cautious. Um, and if you watch the video for version 2.9, you will see um, I was a bit worried that, you know, the clove, for example, would overtake overtake the flavour. Um, it didn't, you know, in 10 days it didn't. Uh, but, you know, some of the other flavours didn't have time enough to develop. So I think, you know, either I need to add more spices or give it more time. Um, and that's something I can experiment with. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, time gives clarity and flavor you know, we've talked about before um, glycerin was a winner it was a winner winner chicken dinner um, and um, i will certainly use it again but interesting interesting um, the sweetness of using the strawberry essences in this one also delivers a wonderful mouthfeel so it's not the glycerin is necessary in every recipe uh, but I certainly think in the simpler recipes that aren't really adding any other um, flavours to them, um, then actually I think it's probably a very, very good tool in your toolkit to include. I'm also going to do an experiment in the future, I think, where I add the minimum amount and the maximum amount um, to see what you know the difference between the two are. I'm particularly interested because I simply just took, took the middle amount as the default when I did that recipe. And while it was a success, um, what does that variation bring? Um, you know, again, you know, reading around and sort of hearing what people have been doing. I am so eager. I've got all the ingredients ready. I'm so eager to do a Vimto cider flavoured, um, so, or a Vimto flavoured cider, I should say. Um, and, um, and that one's definitely on my uh, booking list for future uh, future recipes. I've also got a fantastic family. So my sister and brother-in-law have some real apples. I now own a fruit press and we're going to do a real cider. Um, so that's quite exciting. Um, and I can't really think that I'm going to screw this up because, you know, despite the fact I've copped a few things up along the way, um, it has always, always turned out remarkably well. Um, and so I think, you know, the, my recommendation to you all um, if you haven't tried it already, is honestly, you can't go wrong. You It will turn out wonderfully. Um, so that's really it for Turbo Cider 2.0.
you know, um, I hope you found something in this um, useful. Um, I hope the microphone was working at the beginning and you didn't get me doing mine. Um, in which case I may have to look at how I uh, voice over that or something similar. Um, but, you know, I can fix that in post, as they say. Um, um, if you are um, not subscribed to the channel, please do. Um, I'm, I'm my 24 subscribers. Uh, thank you all um, to, for listening. Um, and here are my plans for the next couple of months. And, uh, and you know, my biggest plan for the next couple of months, in fact, for the next couple of weeks, is I'm going on a holiday. So um, I sort of planned out September and October um, in terms of what's coming up. So Turbo Cider 2.0 is running currently and um, literally the very last episode um, is going to go out. The tasting episode um, will go out on Tuesday. And then we're going to take a complete detour and talk about a DME real ale. Um, I was very lucky, I think, because when I started um, brewing, I, my very first kit was an all grain kit. And so, you know, a lot of the brews I've done and, and actually every brew I've done that, that is in the cider, um, other than the DME real ale, um, has always been an all grain kit. And, um, and so I wanted to try what the DME real ale would turn out like. And, um, and actually, you know, it, um, it took a while to develop and there were still lots of lessons learned along the way. Um, and, um, and funny enough, uh, because there's been some time passed since I actually brewed the DME real ale, um, and, and, and actually this was an ale that definitely improved over time. And, uh, and, and one of the first, um, first taste tests I did, um, I was a little, I was a little disappointed, I think I would be fair to say. Um, but by the time we get to the end and sort of time has passed, um, there is a very different result. And, uh, and so DME is a really useful tool in the toolkit. And I talk a little bit about, you know, not only the recipe I use, which was a DME driven recipe, but also other uses for DME as we go in through that, that activity. Um, I'm going to um, also sort of put up the um, strawberry cider, the one I've been drinking this evening. Um, and that's a, a three part, three part um, sort of uh, three episode piece where we go through the Moss Home and Garden again credit to Moss Home Garden for that recipe um, and um, and again you know you know it has <laughs> I'm saying cheers and you can't see me uh, it's turned out really really well um, um, then in October through to November I'm going to um, sort of talk through a spiced apple wine again following another recipe from another great group of people uh, called City Steading and um, and I've followed one of their recipes for a spiced apple wine. Now, City Steading um, are based in Florida and I'm based in the UK. And what was really interesting about following their recipe is small differences in ingredients based on you know, what was available to me in this country versus what was available to them um, made some really massive differences to the end result. But that having been said, there are then some changes that you can make to actually bring it back to a, an end result that is more similar to um, the original recipe. So I learned lots um, in my spiced apple wine journey and, um, and it turned out great in the end. Um, but it really did take a few details down to, into, um, oh my goodness, this is falling into a complete catastrophe mode uh, before it recovered. So, um, so lots of interesting stuff in that journey. So um, please do um, join in and, um, and, and sort of have a look at those episodes. Um, I'm gonna put, have to put my glass down now because I also want to just quickly um, show you around the website, um, my YouTube site. And one of the things that um, that I've done is each of the, the homebrew uh, recipes I've been doing, as I, I mentioned earlier, I'm actually on homebrew recipe number 15, or literally only just 
put it into the fermenter um, at the weekend, uh, which was a Russian Imperial Stout. I am so looking forward to that one. Um, and um, and so, you know, I break each of the episodes down into small bite-sized chunks. So, for example, if we have a look at um, homebrew number four, uh, the one where things go wrong, um, you know, you can sort of see that I, it actually breaks down into um, the sort of various stages, the, the planning stage, um, the recovery stage, you know, fermentation and, and actually things went wrong. Um, what happens during racking? What happens during flavouring? What happens during bottling? And, you know, um, I, got a, I got some really weird, weird feedback from people who thought that I was um, spreading fake news about danger of blindness. Um, jeepers, creepers, um, I think, you know, um, people just do not have a sense of humour. There is no danger of blindness at all. Uh, but, um, but my family, of course, were my guinea pigs, um, and hence the joke, um, for testing that out. And they were very, very, very good sports in terms of the taste test. Um, so, you know, each of the episodes follows a similar sort of path. I look at the session ale, very similar again. So brew day, boil, transfer, fermentation, bottling, um, and all the way through to drinking. Um, and, um, and, and each of the different recipes I'm working through will follow a similar structure. Um, also available on the site is a link to um, the one gallon homebrew publication which is my medium site uh, where there are some articles around home brewing. Uh, there's far fewer, the fewer of those there, but actually if you are more of a reader than a um, watcher, um, then there are sort of some, some articles there. And there's a good mix of both turbo cider and um, um, all grain brewing type articles that are on the site. So, so please do check those out if you get a moment. Um, and um, and that is it for um, for me. Um, um, I'm going to do another um, live stream, but I'm not going to do it until the end of October when um, I'm back from holidays and I've had a chance to prepare. Uh, one of the my, one of my recent purchases, which I've been having lots of fun and you know and actually lots of success um, with is a mini keg um, or two mini kegs actually um, and the sort of co2 and the regulators and forced carbonation and all the fun and games you can have with that um, it's working really well and i want to do uh, uh, my next live stream to talk about mini kegging um, which is a just simply a small scale version of um, the corny kegs that you sort of see uh, people using when they do the 23 litre brews um, i don't really want to create that level of volume um, and mini kegging is my answer and you can do all of the things that you would expect to do um, with a mini keg or so far anyway um, in terms of everything that i've i've learned um, so that is it for me for today. You know, really do appreciate um, you tuning in and listening. Um, hopefully, you know, hopefully you were able to listen um, if the microphone was working. And, um, and, you know, if you've got any questions, comments, thoughts, anything else, you know, please do post your, um, your questions on the sort of YouTube channel. Um, do like and subscribe. And um, thank you very, very much this evening for tuning in and listening. Um, good health to you all. Um, best wishes. And I'll see you all again in October.